wine, gold, salt, iron, thermal baths, market squares, festivals. These are some of the Celtic threads that we've been following all across Europe. It's very exciting to see how advanced Europe's residents were 3,000 years ago, but even more so to detect the kinds of balanced, interconnected lives they led. Women used to be equals. What changed and how do we change back? What advice would our Iron Age ancestors have for us? In the next few minutes, I'd like to share the essence of our findings with you in a highly condensed form, because I've written four books on the subject, I want to show you our surprising view of the inclusive, innovative, nature-based ways of Europe's Iron Age. My quest started to find out why my grandparents left Slovenia, but the journey has unearthed a rich, vibrant path across Europe. Now a bright light shines on the question how did women go from first line in the Iron Age to back seat today? We see evidence of a welcoming Celtic world that spanned Europe from the British Isles to Anatolia and beyond. With the help of law, language, and archaeology, my husband and I have compiled a record that upends conventional wisdom to reveal a very different view of the ancient world. Starting with our own observations to develop and test theories, we rely on written history only when verifiable with independent proof. Here's why. For the past 2,000 years, the conquerors have written Europe's history, and it's a mythical account. The role of sustained disinformation is a key issue here. Mining truth from mountains of falsehood is a giant task, but it's worth it. Because those few bits of truth promise to open a whole new world of understanding that we need today. Through archaeology, we're seeing Iron Age villages and burial chambers that reflect a family-centric population. But they also show a striking consistency. The villages always have a large fest hall situated on the market square in the prime location. The burial chambers show the veneration of heroes, men and women. How do I say this? Because many of the graves previously identified as male princes are now known to hold women warriors. From the number of these graves that we've seen, it's safe to say that heroes were decorated with gold, and it was often gold jewelry that paid homage to their memory. Repeatedly in the reconstructed Celtic villages, we've seen stores of amphora that still contain traces of wine or olive oil, community baking ovens, and charcoal making. In one woman's burial chamber, we have seen a six-foot-tall wine-mixing vessel, a wagon, a golden torque. What we have not seen in any of these villages, heroes' halls, burial chambers, or hill forts, is any sign of religion or feudal caste systems. We have never seen a palace surrounded by hovels in Iron Age excavations. Let me talk for a minute about early defensive measures. Hill forts had been excavated on forested mountaintops and hilltops all over Europe, hundreds of them. We see Iron Age Europe as agricultural, but also full of production, manuscripts, textiles, pottery, glass, mining, metallurgy, hydrology. From the treasures dug into hillsides, it appears that people lived on farms on the flatlands. When word came of enemies on approach, they grabbed their valuables, dug them into the hillside, and scattered into the forested hilltops. The metal and pottery objects they buried are being turned up now when new roads are cut or buildings excavated. As 
skills of our Iron Age ancestors increased, pre-Christians built defensive walls on these hilltops that then grew to be fortified villages and castles. Let's think about this routine. When danger came, Europe's early residents scattered and hid in the forested hilltops. The young children had to flee with the women because women could feed their children on the run. Who were these attackers? Europe had its Celtic population, and it also had Julius Caesar, who came, saw, and conquered. We have stood on the hillside of Elysia and looked down on the reconstructed battlements that he used to starve an entire town to death, estimated to have numbered in the tens of thousands. Rome fell in the fifth century, and from what we see, it was due in large part to two Celtic families who drove the Romans back out of the Rhineland. The Franks defeated Constantine at Trier, unseating his headquarters there, and the Burgundians drove the Romans out of their old capital at Barbeto Magus, now Worms in Germany. I've devoted a book to each of these families, the Franks and the Burgundians, if you want to know more about them. The Celts must have experienced an era of exuberance after they broke out of the Roman chains. The Caesars had slaughtered and enslaved them by the hundreds of thousands, overtaking the native populations as their personal property, seizing their domains and hill forts, fest halls, abbeys, and thermal baths. You might be thinking, wait a minute, you didn't see religion in Celtic Europe. That's right. Our research shows that abbeys were secular centers of learning and production, open to all. Gardens and vineyards, scriptoria and libraries, hearths for baking, hearths for iron smelting, lodging, fest halls. Later, cloisters would link buildings with indoor-outdoor corridors to form a central, beautiful courtyard garden. I also said Celtic thermal baths because invariably Celtic baths lie beneath the Roman ones. Europeans used to winter over at hot springs to survive the cold. As part of the health resort villages that formed around the thermal sources, parks and gardens became a standard feature. So life in the Iron Age consisted of seasonal living as well as defensive preparations. In times of peace, planting and harvesting drove the schedule. Families lived on their farms with frequent visits to the market square and great hall to celebrate holidays like the solstice and equinox and occasions like weddings, births, and funerals. To work, write, learn a trade, or listen to scholars, Celts went to the abbeys. Then after a push for the fall harvest, it was time for restoration at the hot springs. Wherever a Celt happened to be at a time of celebration, the halls would be decked with holly in winter, flowers in summer. These times of peace between the fall of Rome and the Crusades lasted about 500 years, approximately between the 5th and 10th centuries. During that time, Women founded and managed many of the abbeys. In times of siege, locals fled to the hills, first to hill forts, later to the castles that replaced them. After the 10th century, cavalries of armed hooded monks called crusaders conducted long, brutal barrages against Celtic strongholds in Europe. They targeted Lithuania and the Baltic region. The onslaught of Carcassonne in southern France lasted for 13 years and involved the poisoning of the water supply. Let me summarize by saying this. The Romans invaded Europe just before the start of the current era. Some centuries later, the Holy Romans used the same playbook, but this time they made the fest halls into churches and put their priests in each village. As of the 5th century, the Romans had codified slavery in their laws as necessary for running their economic engines. As a result, dictators sprang up to stake out their own separate nations, each with its own separate royalty language, lands, and borders. Together, these fiefdoms formed the church state. That's what Europe became. But it's not 
how it started out. How does this fit with the women's story? Celtic heroic epic style of escorted delegations of women riding horseback all day to be received at pavilions with food and wine. From England to the Rhineland, we hear about women who led charges against Romans for killing their husbands and raping their daughters. Julius Caesar is said to have remarked that the Celtic men were fearsome, but with their women at their side, they were invincible. These legends, whether or not true down to the last detail, offer insights into why violence against women is so prevalent today. Looking backward at medieval Europe, the Holy Roman vendetta against Celtic women is hard to ignore. Early Christian writings call women the gates of hell. They worshiped only male gods and made abbeys male only to name only a few instances. When the Holy Romans turned the Celtic fest halls into Christian churches, they closed the doors to all but the subservient, those who pledged fealty to lords and masters. The Christians used one other highly effective weapon to subjugate the Celts, deceit. As they raked in Celtic riches, Christian officials extolled poverty, as their priests burned priceless illuminated manuscripts, the church claimed to civilize savages while burning countless thousands of women at the stake. Christians preached kindness. The church state criminalized secular expression and its fiefdoms. Rome's armies enforced the church's desires. For 1,400 of the past 2,000 years, church tribunals invoked heresy laws to sentence unknown numbers to death, the majority of whom were women. The direction of our research is leading us to witch burnings. We see correlations between these deaths and the beautiful paintings in former fest halls that appear to commemorate them. Our film Hallstatt's Warrior Women details one such instance in the very place that gives its name to the early Iron Age, Hallstatt, Austria. How do we change back? If civilization really means subjugation, how do we recapture the innocence of the past? First and foremost, we must come to grips with Christianity as a master-servant system that glorifies men and denigrates women. That is why religion must be kept separate from government, and freedom from religion must be assured in a free society. Religions do not act in the public interest or for the common good. Since they do not benefit the entirety, Religions need to pay taxes. Our ancestors had a system of government by the people and for the people, and they treated men and women as equals. It can be done because it has been done. We can become a cosmopolitan world that welcomes and honors all people, regardless of gender, again, and we can write a new much more accurate account of our ancestral Europe.